Here we are at Ivers. Yeah. And you're about to order some some food. Yeah. Here's the menu. No, oh, there's the menu. Yeah. Can you see it? I I can. It's it, it's coming up quite nicely. All right. So my question for you is, uh, why are we here? We're here because uh, this week's um, blog relates to this week's feature in the Times, which is about uh, action largely in part of the waterfront that's a little bit north of here. We are on Pier 54, which was the first or most southerly of the northern Pacific piers built in the early 20th century. The picture this week uh, is of the Baker's Pier, or it had other names too. Last name was the Arlington Pier before it then became one of the railroad piers and the last to be built of the big piers that are still surviving now on the waterfront. So if we go forward four piers from here, that is to the north, we would wind up uh, in what was the Milwaukee Railroad Pier, but which is now, what, 54, 55, 56, 57. We're in 54, that's 67, uh, uh, 57, and uh, that's where the, the ship, the name of which I have a tough time pronouncing. In fact, uh, let me make this point right now and and uh, insert a request from Jean because uh, the ship that we're looking at is a name for a Scottish town which was eight miles north of the border between Scotland and England and about the same distance from the Irish Sea. Mm -hmm. And I seem to be going into the... <laughs> I'll try. You're much better at that. I better you're, not do it. You're, you're do you're <laughs> You're, I think you're doing leprechaun, which is leprechaun. more Irish than Scottish. I'm doing the leprechaun, <laughs> Scottish. So anyway, it's got a rather difficult name. Here's, I brought the file here, titled uh, Ivor's Divorce. Oh. But we're not discussing that. It just happens to be the, the manila folder available. So right. here's the name of the ship. Can you, can you get on that one? Eclafecan. Well, it's a good try. and You may be right on. I would try Eclafecan. Just because you just said that. Oh. Eclafecan. All right. Well, these are the notes. Quite a few notes. That's how many more notes were involved in writing this four little paragraphs that wound up in the Seattle Times. Well, tell us the story now that we're sitting on the waterfront, only a couple hundred yards from where the Eclafecan. Eclafecan. What's <laughs> that? Sounds obscene, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, would you like to order now? Go ahead. You mean, what's with that halibut that you mentioned? The bacon wrapped halibut? Yeah, no, I don't want bacon though. Oh yeah, we can do, actually we have two different preparations as well. Yeah. Um, one simply grilled, with served with red mashed potatoes, whipped with sour cream and green onions. Mm -hmm. And then also uh, sauteed spinach and acorn squash. This is Erica, right? <laughs> yes, Erica. Right. Erica. Erica's from Boise, Idaho. Well, nearby Boise, Idaho. I claim Seattle. How long have you been here in Seattle? Six years. Thank you, Eric. You're welcome. I'll clear up the space for you there. Okay, so tell me more. Well, the picture that we're using looks from the Schwabacher Wharf, which is no longer there. It looks south from it. And the Schwabacher Wharf is a very unique in the history of Seattle and, and had some great events occur on it. First of all, it was the only wharf to survive the Great Fire because bucket teams were running on the uh, Seattle Lake Shore and Eastern and the Ramsford and Trestles and stopping the fire before it could reach the Schwabacher Wharf. And uh, that meant that the Schwabacher Wharf became the principal pier in the first months after the fire for refurbishing, restocking Seattle for its rebuilding following the 1889 fire. Uh, later on, and very soon later on, uh, our ship, which I'll remind you, is spelled so, and pronounced, how is that, Gene, would you say? I still say Eclafecan. Can we just call it that, sh that Scottish ship? The Scottish ship. The Scottish yeah. ship, yeah, okay. We'll call it. Uh, that was parked there sometime in the early 90s, before the pier was blown over in 92 uh, in by a huge wind, the famous wind knocked the pier down and they built another one much longer but called it the Arlington Pier and uh, that then was replaced by the Milwaukee Pier in the early 20th century. So that's the short history of the piers there. The uh, Eclef, no that Scottish, that Scottish big, big ship the tall ship, they call it. The Scottish tall ship uh, was built in Glasgow in the 80s. 
a name for the town, which was, as you'll read in the article, the birthplace of which uh, famous author, Gene? Of Thomas Carlyle. Thomas Carlyle. He, he was really quite a lively writer. I mean, he was controversial, really, and lively. But anyway, they named it for him, that ship, and probably because the builder of the ship must have been in love with Carlyle. I mean, liked Carlyle a lot. And, and Carlyle's was, bust was on the ship? It, it was on the front, you know, that, uh, what do they call the, the I forget what you call that thing that's at the top, the front of the ship. It's usually a woman, right. often a bare-breasted woman looking, looking out over the ocean, but not with Carlyle's case. But I think it's true, because one claimed that that was there and that that was, that was Carlyle's face on the front of the ship. Now, for, a, for an iron-hulled ship, the yeah. Eclafecum didn't last very long, did it? No, it uh, met a bad end. It was uh, only around for, well, for less than 20 years. And its fate uh, hit it in 90, 1900, I think. Uh, it was taking, oh, it was, it was bringing, uh, if Jasmine and Jute, Jute, it was bringing jute, which is a kind of uh, material for making sacks and things, uh, from India uh, to Scotland for manufacturing sacks and the like. Gunny sacks, right? Their jutes used a lot of those. And it ran across some rocks only 50 miles from its destination in Dundee, Scotland. So, and then it broke in half. But most of the jute was actually saved. Hmm. Yeah, well, thank goodness for that. Thank goodness for the jute saving. Yeah, I wrote a poem about jutes once. My first poem that I remember. Should I recite it to you? Please do. If jasmines and jutes were fictional fruits and their succulents, a sense of no demonstrance, I would still plead my bellies aching for some jellies made of jasmines and jutes. Palate nonsense. There you have it. Short poem. That's marvelous. That rhymes nicely. Can be made into a song. You know? It does. It's it. It, it has a remarkable that I remember it, isn't it? It is remarkable. Probably was a teenager when I wrote it. Wow. That has nothing to do with Schwabackers. But Schwabackers then became the site for the landing first of uh, the first tra uh, regular uh, Japanese ship to come to Seattle, largely with tea, and to pick up things to take back to Japan. What the heck was the name of that ship? Well, I've dropped it. They all had Maru at the end of it, like that was ship. Maru, Maru yeah. yeah. yeah that's a it was one Japanese of those Maru ship. ships. And then a year later in 97... Oh, I know what happened. What was that? Well, that was the Yukon. You got it. And it was the what what boat brought the ton of gold down from the Yukon. Oh, the Portland. Yeah, yeah of course, it was the Portland. It was yeah. the Portland. So the Portland came then in 97, I think July 17th, with a ton of gold on the headlines of the Post-Intelligence Service. Well, the Schwakemacher Wharf was ultimately destroyed. It, it just fell apart. And then all you had all these other big railroad piers to either side of it, so that... Uh, uh, it became the perfect place when there, when monies were available in the 60s from forward thrust, the 68 forward thrust drive, to build a waterfront park. And that's what's there now. And that's what Gene looks across, not from the Schwabacker Wharf, but rather from the Pike Street Wharf. When he looks south, where the merry ground is now, where the what's the name of that vessel again? The Scottish ship, Eclafecan. That's where the Eclafecan is uh, in its slip there, resting for a moment, filling up with we know not what. We could probably find out, you know, by checking the local newspapers, find out what ships were in, what they were carrying or picking up or something. But I didn't do that. Now there's so much more history about the waterfront. In fact, we have a. My personal Bible about that is this right here. Oh, yeah. The Illustrated History of Seattle's Waterfront, which you can look at in toto on this blog. It's there if you go to the front page. And you can keyword anything you want to your heart's content. It's fully, wonderfully illustrated, but it's not available for sale. It was just done, about 100 copies were done for libraries and the like. I couldn't interest the uh, University of Washington press in publishing some variation of it 
they wanted me just to do something like Murray Morgan's uh, Gold Rush book, which is mostly pictures and a, <clears throat> a few captions, but I was interested in a more complex, involved description of waterfront history. So it is, survives right here for you to enjoy and search on this blog. Okay? Can we, let's, let's bring that up again later on, okay? Okay, we, we will. Uh, so any questions, Gene, about the waterfront? Well, you've had a long history down on this waterfront, and we're sitting in Ivar's in, Ivar's in part because because you actually were, were were good friends with with Ivar himself, or Ivar as his friends called him. And yeah. uh, on Sunday, this Sunday, you're doing a lecture oh, at good point. Uh, if I, the Southwest Historical Society. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. About. I hope it doesn't. Well, about, Ivar's youth. About Ivar's youth. Ivar's youth in uh, West Seattle. Ivor was born in West Seattle in 1905, the same year they put up that uh, that uh, pylon or, in West Seattle to commemorate the the first landing of uh, of the Denny Party and the like at at LT Point. Right. So we're going to broach all that stuff on Ivor's youth of West Seattle, and he lived there pretty much until about the age of 40 or so. Now. He was born in 1905. He pretty much came over to this side of the of this uh, Elliott Bay in order to do first of all the aquarium and then to open the acres of clams, which opened in '46. Right. Maybe you do want to do a pan through this. Sure, I'll yeah. do I'll do a pan and then. Uh, uh, yeah, this is the see. new acres of clams. I mean, this is one that they took the uh, opportunity when they were redoing the waterfront to rebuild this uh, restaurant and I think they did a pretty marvelous job of it. Your voice So here we are, we're looking here we are now, looking we're actually down. looking down in the big main dining area. And look at over here, did you see the, you can see the Galbraith and Bacon sign that was along the the south side of the pier. They found that when they were ripping out the, uh, the old extended uh, uh, part of the pier and they decided to preserve it and show it off as their principal graphic for their dining area. And they all another thing they did, which you pan just by, is that's where the offices was. That's where our Ivor's office was. That's where Bob's office was. That's where many offices were. And that they have turned into an outside dining area, which is quite wonderful because the magic about this place is, what is the cliche about restaurants and their successes? What are those three most important reasons for success in a restaurant? Location, location, location. You know it. Location, oh, yeah. what a cliche. And they got it here, right? Looking out at the at the fireboats, looking out at the ferries as they're coming in and going out right over here in Coleman Dock. But now also from the dining area, looking out across Elliott Bay to the Olympics, which on this gray day are hidden. We can assure you that there's a lot more about this part of the waterfront to talk about and show pictures. But just go to the bloody, I mean, the fine book that we put online, and you'll find a lot there. Right? All right. Well. So should we say goodbye, Gene? We can. Why goodbye, Paul. Goodbye, Gene. Goodbye.